We're just getting started here with Reverend David Ould. Um, we're waiting for him to check in. And he is from New Zealand, I believe. Um, we'll let him explain that. He describes himself as a British Australian. So is that we're waiting for you, David, to unite? David, can you hear me? <laughs> I can see you. Oh, wait a minute. What's this here? I was I was muted. Classic Zoom mistake. <laughs> How are you, David? I'm well. How about you? Boy, you're. A, I'm doing good. And you, I really messed up. <laughs> I think you may have. You wouldn't be the first American to think everyone's in their time zone. <laughs> <laughs> I put it down for Friday. And I got it on my little paper thing here, and then you. Oh my word. Anyways, we're here. All good. We're here now. <laughs> um, can you start us in prayer? Sure, sure. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. Uh, we pray as we get to know each other uh, that it will be a blessing uh, to those who get to watch this interview. In fact, surprise us uh, by how you use um, our time together. And we pray this in Jesus' great name. Amen. Amen. Well, the floor is yours. Tell us about David Poole. You're a reverend, a rector, I take it. Sure. sure. So actually not a rector at the moment. So it's David Old. Um, so oh. I know I have that extra little U in there, but that's my father's fault. Don't know why that is. Uh, but David Old. Um, I am senior associate minister at St. John's Anglican Cathedral in Parramatta, which is in the west of the Sydney Basin, and actually the um the the site of the original colony here in New South Wales in Australia. We are the longest continual site of Christian worship in the whole of Australia and one of the first two original parishes that cover the whole of the old colony. But as you may tell from uh, my accent, I'm not originally here from Australia. I grew up in the United Kingdom in the north uh, in a city called Sheffield, uh, which is where my first experience of church was within uh, kind of mainstream middle of the road, uh, at times uh, gospel lacking Church of England. Yeah, uh, what else can I tell you? Uh, I'm married to Jackie, who's from Singapore, and we have three children. The eldest is uh, 19 and at university, and then two boys who are school age. The, uh, the oldest one is doing his final exams this, this coming year. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And Sheffield, and did you say Cathedral Church? So I'm, we're at Parramatta Cathedral. Well, it's technically a pro-cathedral. Uh, the Diocese of Sydney is quite a large uh, entity. And in the 60s, they had a bit of a conversation about maybe splitting up uh, the diocese into a number of, of dioceses. And so with a view to that, a number of, of the old sort of central churches were, were renamed as pro-cathedrals. Uh, the whole idea to split the diocese fell apart. We turned up as being regions, but we've ended up sort of being, a, I think they'd now call it a regional cathedral. So we are we are technically the seat of the Bishop of Western Sydney, who is one of the assistant bishops to the ordinary, who, of course, is Archbishop Kanishka Raffel. So when I hear cathedral, I, I'm thinking cathedral music. Do you get that? Well, um, we don't have much of that at the moment. Uh, uh, Sydney evangelicalism, along with much of Australian uh, English sort of low church evangelicalism, uh, doesn't have much of that kind of old traditional uh, uh, church music anymore. We've still got a wonderful organ, which gets um, uh, played uh, predominantly at one of our services uh, every Sunday. But uh, sort of the call for a, a choir and that sort of thing has, has passed away. There's been a real cultural shift uh, in, 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 in those things, in, in these sorts of circles. It is, however, my background i do love a bit of the old church music i was a chorister in the day and you know with the rough around my collar and all, all that kind of thing so i don't mind a bit of it but um it's that all things to all men thing at the moment uh, that's being pursued here and perhaps that the flavor of sydney evangelicalism might be a might be part of our conversation today oh explain that to me because well sure. I, I got a different trajectory and tr tradition yeah, so it's a very um it's a very it's a very low church evangelicalism. Uh, it's shared in conjunction with similar people from the United Kingdom and the Church of England. Part of the way to understand it, its its legacy is to understand that uh when the first fleet came out in the late 18th century, uh, of course came out to New South Wales with with convicts for a a, a prison colony because uh the um the Americans got a little bit uh, rebellious and decided they didn't want the British to run uh, to rule there anymore. So George 
Georgia was no longer available to dump our criminals oh. into. So they got sent across the world uh, to to New South Wales uh, or just, you know, the new land out here as, as it was. The um, the Clapham sect, uh, those guys in in London from whom, you know, Wilberforce eventually came and Newton and all those sort of guys, uh, they funded the passage of a chaplain to to go uh, over to Australia with 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 the first fleet. That man was called Richard Johnson, a thoroughgoing evangelical, but kind of in that pioneer spirit uh, came out. And um, Australia has always been kind of an anti-authoritarian, uh, cut down the tall poppy kind of culture. I think a lot of it stems from that original sort of convict uh, versus uh, prison warden kind of mentality. And so um, the evangelicalism that, that, that was bred out here was that kind of very raw pioneer spirit um even evangelicalism uh that eschews more of the um more of the uh uh what they might see as the high church almost fripperies you know we see ourselves more in line with jc ryle and his sort of uh rejection of, of some of those of some of those those things indicative as they may have been as he was um challenging the oxford movement uh and so it might be an overreaction to those things uh quite quite possibly but it is it is the flavor of what we have today in in that sort of churchmanship here 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 in australia so um for example we 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 don't use the bcp 1662 uh, uh, one of our services we use the AAPB, which is a nineteen a late, very late nineteen seventies uh, revision uh, um, of that. And a lot of Sydney Anglicans would say we're we're in the spirit of the prayer book. So I'm a, I'm a thoroughgoing church man myself, but it's it's kind of one of those you know you go through the articles and it says you know everything doesn't have to look have to have to look the same at every time and it needs to be appropriate to to the context that we're in. We're in a very anti authoritarian. Uh, relaxed culture uh, here in Australia, and so it, it does uh, behoove us to to work out what perhaps the um the best way of 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 speaking uh, those eternal truths into that into that contemporary culture are, and um, uh, the evangelicals here and in many other places have chosen a low church way uh, uh, to do that. Yeah, I I think you've explained low versus high. Yes. Um, I'm always a little troubled by that. I, some have called me a high churchman hmm. because I like cathedral tradition. My wife has a PhD in, in sure. pipe organ and sacred music, and we're in the bishop's church, and we get yeah. that. Yeah. You know, you know, preaching, well, we can talk about that later, but yeah, yeah. I'm, on the other hand, would be described as low because I'm out yeah. of formed episcopal tradition yeah. and historically black gown 39 articles with the american book sure but that's how sure. they would they would cast themselves in the past which yeah you use the word fripperies well, you know, I was trying to be a bit cheeky. I think Donald, what's really interesting <laughs> is, I think what's, I think what's really interesting is, it's, um, as as we come from different church cultures, which is what we do, it's really important that we listen very carefully to each other to hear what we're actually saying. I had a remarkable experience in Singapore where I worked for a while under an American uh, Episcopalian clergyman, an, an evangelical, no doubt, although charismatic in in, in his leaning, and uh, it was a bit jarring for me because I'd come out of this quite low church. Uh, um, environment in England and then I worked for this guy who when he opened his mouth I was agreeing with all the evangelical convictions he was saying but then he he had an alb on and he would wear a stole uh, uh, for what he would call the Eucharist uh, and all of a sudden I realized that what I thought were the axes of understanding how things functioned uh, were not universal and that different people are going to do different things in different ways and so what you need to do is just listen very carefully to their convictions, hear why they're doing what they're doing, uh, and then, you know, judge them on that. Don't just, you know, some of my very best friends who are reformed will will swing a censor around from time to time. Uh, they're Americans, right? Uh, um, and, and you listen to why they're doing that, and they're talking it through, and they're doing it for very different reasons to the way that other high churchmen are doing it. So it's actually just taught me just to stop, set back, listen to what's going on and actually go all right my real question is not whether they're wearing robes or not but 
whether they are and how they're doing it is an interesting question to ask, but fundamentally underneath, what are their theological convictions? So as we open up, you know, we're Anglicans, as we open up our prayer book, as we open up the 39 articles, are we are we happy to salute that um, and go, that's absolutely convictionally where we stand, uh, or is something else going on? So uh, that's that's been one of my journeys as traveling from the UK to Singapore through here to Australia, just going sit a little bit loose to churchmanship itself uh, and think through what are the underlying theological convictions going on. Yeah, my tradition was a reaction to the Tractarian movement in yeah. America. Yeah. And they read Anglican textbooks for the seminary reading list and Reformed textbooks. And so they were Protestant, Reformed, prayer bookish. They had an Anglican sensitivity, Episcopalian, yeah. very, very anti Tractarian and very yeah. anti ritualistic, more in the spirit of that uh, esteemed American bishop, Bishop McGilvane, yeah. Charles Pettit McGilvane, who yeah. was real, he was loved in England. The, Arch yeah. the Archbishop said of him that it was impossible to know him and not love him. <laughs> he died in Florence, Italy on vacation his body was shipped through London and was the only American to lie in state at the Westminster Abbey before further transfer back to Ohio for interment. But that's kind of the, you know, so uh, we've had some real challenging times in the last generation in the Reformed Episcopal Church. And yeah, we now have a presiding bishop who endorses uh, what I would call using the West. I, I came in from the Presbyterian side, fell in love with a prayer book. Yeah. I have three generations of Veaches in Canada from 1808 to 1921 that were Canadian Anglicans up in farm people. And then 1921, for some unknown reason, I don't know, my grandpa and grandma Veach became Canadian Presbyterians, 1921. And I was in that tradition and catechized. Yep. And so, um, you know, when you've got a bishop who's endorsing, here's the Westminster language, carnal, Capernaitic presence of Christ in the elements, yeah, substantiation, or, you know, I call it transubstantiation without uh, Aristotle. <laughs> uh, now, yes. this is completely contrary to one of its foundational principles. And then he, he, there's the uh, endorsement of praying to sa departed saints, endorsement on the Anglican office, where there's dozens of intercessions by his intercession, by her intercession. So, you know, I got a major Charlie horse between the ears. Well, I'm glad to know we're not the. I'm glad to know we're not the only ones with our with 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 our issues, and I suspect these 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 battles have to be fought every every couple of generations or so. Uh, and and again, what will intrigue me is that the way that they are fought will depend upon the context that um, uh, that that you're in. So 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 um, you know, I can see the, a lot of the REC guys going back to, yes, I want to be going surplus, cassock and surplus, or even just, you know, a Geneva gown. And that's my way of sort of fighting against that. Whereas here in this context, it's almost the rejection of 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 a lot of vestments uh, um, because of how they're used by others as well. And so, again, I think this thing to our to our viewers where we just go. Um, work out why they're doing what they're doing. Um, you know, uh, this might be a slightly broader church than you think. Uh, um, you know, uh, and you and I must surely agree at the end of the day, when we open up our scriptures, we, we don't find any 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 prescription on 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 investments. <laughs> so so at that point, we just need to be really careful about what we're what we're prescriptive about and what we're not prescriptive about. Unless you think Jesus had a mitre on at the last summer. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to find anybody who thought that. I'm sure they exist somewhere. <laughs> That's right. You know, I, I don't think there were even any vestments for the first three centuries or four. Quite possibly not. 
quite possibly not. Uh, and and that's why we just need to be really, really careful. And don't get me wrong. I actually I'm a churchman at heart from 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 back in England. So uh, on appropriate occasions, I will I will vest appropriately. Uh, so uh, formal as indeed civic occasions here. I'll certainly uh, put on what's appropriate. We had a, a Thanksgiving service for the late Her Majesty uh, um, last year. And I, I you know, you know, I went with the academic court and everything for that as well. Uh, so so where it's appropriate, absolutely appropriate. Um, and but in other occasions here, we're making the decision uh, not to do it. Others will differ. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I said my piece on that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, if he, if you had to come over for oh, you're you're in Australia, right? Or New Wales? Um, yes. In, 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 in Australia, in New South Wales, in Sydney. Yeah. Yeah. OK. If you had to come over to one of the old rec prayer book services you'd have seen a few yeah. oddities you know instead of the praying for the royals we pray for the president sure uh a little tweak here on the declaration of remission instead of being based on the minister declaring they wanted to insert based upon the assurances given in god's word that he pardoneth and absolveth so yes a, a few and little... that's under i think that's understood in the declaration anyway isn't it surely <laughs> yeah. You know. So I mean, you would have been, fit right yeah. in. You'd you'd say, "Oh, these black gowners," you know, but ninety eight percent of it you'd recognize. Yeah, absolutely. And I think probably the only thing I'd be doing is I'd be I'd be just gently saying to the guys around me, "Let's be clear on why we're wearing the gown." Yeah, and well, what we're achieving. By it. The origin of it on the RE side was Bishop Cummins. He wore the you know the the Rochet and Chimer. Khmer, Khmer, yep. whatever, however you say it. But he said, you know, it makes me feel superior to my presbyters. Yeah. And he goes, it's a power symbol. And so I just want to take it off and be a primus inter pares. And so he began. Yeah. It was a real practical I... move. It was. And, yeah. and can I add to that? Because where where we where we're located today in in Sydney, we're at the confluence of of two very large uh, groups of 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 immigrants in the last twenty years. Uh, one is from the Chinese mainland, and the other is from India, and particularly the south of India. And so, a lot of our um, church members at St John's Cathedral are originally from Church of South India, uh, and culturally, of course, they have a very different view often of their pastors and and how they how they uh, approach them and, and how they how they refer to them. Uh, and in one sense, it is, it is lovely to be loved in that way by by your church family. And there's just a cultural difference in the way that <laughs> they they um, approach you. And in another sense, there's, there can be that unhealthy thing uh, underneath that, that elevates the minister to a position that he he simply shouldn't hold, which is no good for anybody, least of all for me myself, uh, being told that I'm special. That's never good for anybody, is it, to be told they're special? Um, and so uh, in one sense, um, that choice to, to sort of deliberately undermine some of those things that might be unhelpful is is what's going on there as well so so again it's contextual you've got to work out who your people are what's the best thing for them uh, um how do you maintain the dignity of the office uh while not making it something that it that it's not after all at the end of the day i'm just one beggar showing all the other beggars where the food is <laughs> exactly yeah um, do you in by the way when i put this on you know youtube and facebook i'll put your yep. name reverend david old yep uh, what are the uh, acronym for your church? Is it Australian Anglican Church? So we're the Anglican Church of Australia, and we're the Diocese of Sydney so within the Anglican, Anglican Church. Church. Of Anglican Church of Australia <laughs> at the moment. Who knows how the next okay. couple of years will go? Uh, and we're the Diocese of Sydney within that. And I think the thing for again for viewers to to be uh, cognizant of is that the Australian Anglican Church has a much more federal um, subsidiarity kind of um, way of, of governing itself. We meet in General Synod every three or four years. General Synod can't legislate anything that the diocese don't individually then sign up for as well. So we're a much more power is much more dispersed 
in in the um in the Anglican Church of Australia than other places are are um are, are used to. Say, for example, that in the Church of England, the General Synod has a lot more authority uh to to legislate and to influence what happens in the individual diocese. Whereas here there's a big um there's a big thrust of autonomy in the diocese. And we certainly want to be governing ourselves in 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 that way. So so it's a it's we're at an interesting stage, obviously. We've had the same sex marriage debate now raging on. We've had the failure of our of uh, the majority of our bishops to uphold an orthodox statement on marriage at the general synod and we're in that we're in that lurching in between phase where we're trying to work out what the future looks like and that will of course be familiar to many of your viewers yes yes are you did i hear you right that there's some bishops in australia supporting the same-sex marriage yeah, so I mean that's obviously been going on for a while, and and again you're familiar with how this sort of just infiltrates through, and you know, you know people just do stuff on the ground. Our, our general synod finally met uh, in May of last year, and uh, the precursor to that had been a, a legal opinion by what we call our appellate, appellate tribunal. All of this is on my my website, which I'm sure you'll link to afterwards, uh, where they've been asked the question of whether the blessing of of people in a same-sex marriage was contrary to the constitution of the Anglican Church of Australia, which is a really robust constitution. The appellate tribunal managed to wangle its way around that by arguing that the word doctrine in the constitution of the Anglican Church of Australia was so, so tightly narrowly defined as to be almost uh, 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 meaningless. And so therefore it wasn't contrary to that doctrine. And again, that, that's been a big, you can read all about that. But things, we decided we needed to sort it out. So we went to General Synod and we debated uh, amongst all the other stuff that you do, we debated two statements. And the first statement was a just a vanilla, here's what marriage is, and therefore we can't sanction uh, um, uh, uh, this, the uh, same-sex marriage stuff. And uh, it passed overwhelmingly in both the House of Laity and the House of Clergy. Then it came to the House of Bishops, the Diocesan Bishops, and the vote was 10 in favour and 12 against. Uh, and so uh, with a couple of abstentions. And um, and that was uh, it was one of those crystallising moments like you kind of knew it was coming. But when it finally arrived, uh, it was uh, it was pretty horrible. Uh, and um, and then we we passed another statement by a similar vote. Um, we passed it. And that one was about chastity. And so actually these bishops almost contradicted themselves in the way that they voted um, uh, on that. Uh, and uh, and then even worse happened on later on. Uh, and again, I got some blogs uh, on what happened at General Synod. I was there. We ended up being unable to affirm the, the fundamental declarations of our constitution. Uh, it was a great moment, actually, Donald, because these um, a, a couple of people got up and said, let's do a motion on unity. We all want to be united in what we believe. And so a very wise conservative said, great, then I want to amend the motion to say, here's what we united on. And then he just quoted the fundamental declarations of the Constitution of the Anglican Church of Australia, like the opening bit, right? The, the thing that if as as Australian Anglicans, if we should be united on anything, it's it's those things. And um, and that just caused an absolute absolute firestorm. Uh, so you ended up with these Anglicans going, we want to be united. So the Conservatives went, right, let's be united on what we declare we are as Australian Anglicans. And went, no, we can't be united on that. So um, it just got a bit silly. It is, it's actually farcical when you think about it. And I'm laughing. Uh, and and there were actually moments there in May where, where, where we were crying. Um, I think the predominant memory I actually have is when the first marriage statement failed is one of the main Orthodox bishops just sitting at his table weeping because he was just, he could not believe that, you know, his fellow bishops, men and, and a few women who had made the same promises that he had made were so willing to abrogate those promises. Where, uh, so where do you see we're at that moment where do you see this going well it's hard to tell so what's going on at the moment is you're starting to see individual congregations from parishes leave with their ministers for in some of the dioceses uh there's been uh two or three up in the diocese of brisbane which is the diocese of southern queensland one of the main liberal places has been uh, another one uh further north uh, uh, right in the tip uh, of northern Queensland. Uh, there are a couple coming in Western Australia as well. I understand so there'll be that slow bleed. Um, the question is whether the House of Bishops will ever properly meet again in, in as a proper house, because, you know, um, what's been great here is the Conservative bishops have been really clear on their lines and drawn them clearly in the sand. And, and, uh, and now a lot of the Liberals are going, oh, what are you doing now? You know, why are you behaving this way? And, and the conservatives are basically going, well, we told you, we told you this was the line. 
so we're at, we're at that moment now where we're kind of just trying to work out what it what it will look like uh whether we'll even meet again as a general synod will be interesting uh because you know uh sydney is by far and away the largest diocese in the country um uh, uh and uh so we pay our you know we pay our quota into the general synod on the basis of size and the number of clergy and so on and lots of people in sydney are going why are we why are we sending hundreds of thousands of dollars to run this thing and then paying for our people to go <laughs> um when you know when this is going on so those questions are being asked out loud uh and are uh, being discussed uh, uh behind many many different doors but uh, early days we don't probably have to make that decision for another two or three years yet so we're just going to see how it all you know it all plays out i don't know is, i really don't know is the australian anglican church part of gafcon uh, so there are individual dioceses that are affiliated to GAFCON, and there are a number of dioceses that quite clearly would not be. <laughs> so the Diocese of Sydney, strong member of GAFCON, obviously, probably one of those key undergirding members. I certainly will be in Kigali uh, in April. I've been at the last um, two GAFCONs and uh, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed them. Um, and uh, was wondering about Kigali, a bit expensive to go currently and a bit of a bit of a way. But I think recent events in the Church of England have have uh reconfirmed the the need and the urgency for us to be to be there and for uh conservative evangelicals like myself to be making their own contribution into that into that conversation as we work out together how we're going to hold the line um against what's going on right now i one of the men i want to talk to is dr lee gatis or gaddis yeah yep um he he had kind of an ex um, I'm not going to say explosive. That's not, it's a little loaded. Uh, it's quite yeah. robust, quite robust for an Englishman, I think is what you might say. <laughs> is his response. Quite a what? But necessary, quite robust for an Englishman. There you but, go. But, but necessary, but it necessary at this moment. That is farcical what has been proposed by the House of Bishops and the Church of England. And quite, um, I think, disappointing would be too weak a word for to see Justin Welby's wholehearted endorsement of it. Lee used the word insulting to my intelligence. Yeah, I think it is. They just, you know, yeah, uh, the notion that these blessings are not clearly changing the doctrine of marriage uh, is is quite ridiculous. Uh, and uh, we just need to be really, really clear about that and just say we're not being fooled. We're not fooled by it. L let me ask a really basic question. Sure. The doctrine of scripture. Mm hmm. Uh in the Sydney of diocese. How, yeah. I know Article 6 of the 39. Yeah. I'm a yeah. Westminster Chapter 1 man, and I'm through the old Princeton line and Jim Boyce and R.C. Sproul, personal friends. Fairly robust, yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. so I come out of the inerrancy, infallibility, the whole, that whole yeah. school. Where yeah. does, what about the diocese of Sydney? Um, thoroughly robust, thoroughly robust in the same manner. You'd feel perfectly at home. Let me give you an example of how important they think uh, the scriptures are and their and their understanding. I I went to seminary at Moore Theological College here in Sydney. Uh, I did four years uh, full time, uh, 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 which in itself is extraordinary uh, uh, to do four whole years. Uh, let me tell you what our biblical. Let me give you tell you what our biblical language learning was like. Um, in my third year of the four of the four years, uh, at the end of the year, I was preparing for my third year exams as a number of years ago, and I was preparing for a New Testament, uh, which would be one theology paper and then one exegesis paper. And the exegesis paper is they would give you a chunk of Greek text uh, uh, and just say you've got an hour. So you need to write, you need to do a translation, you need to write on the variants, you need to then sort of do it like an exegetical paper uh, on it, discuss the issues and then do a little brief commentary on it. So quite, a, and, and you've got two of those to do. Uh, um, and you and you prepare a chunk of the original text from where they're going to pick that significant chunk as well. So I happen to be online as you are, um, just doing my work and, and my brother, I have a twin brother in the UK who's gone through the same process in, in England and he had uh, the previous year completed his uh, um, ordination training at Wycliffe College at the University of Oxford. So not shabby, that's what I'm saying, University of Oxford educated uh, in theology. And, and he said, oh, what are you working on today? And I was like, well, I'm working on my Greek text, uh, trying to prepare my Greek text for, for the exam. Uh, and 
I said to him, what did you do in third year, your final year? What, what was your Greek text in, in final year? And I think he said something like, ah, oh, Romans 8. I had to know the whole of Romans 8 in the Greek and <laughs> like, really know it well. He says to me, what's your prepared Greek text? I said, ah, oh, Romans 5 to 8 and the equivalent amount of text in the Luke Acts corpus as well. So that was the that was the level to which they were they were preparing us just in terms of New Testament, let alone let alone Hebrew Old Testament, are uh, uh, working very hard, um, and it 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 just breeds this this mentality that the text is is you know what's most important. This is the way that God speaks. This is the way He does His work. Um, and so me, when I'm training and working with my associates and our interns and so on, one of the phrases they'll keep hearing me say is God does his work through his word by the spirit. So your job is to exposit the text well and appropriately to the circumstance that you're in. And that can look in very different ways, depending uh, uh, what you're in. Your job is to rightly divide that word of truth, to use Paul's language and just lay it out and let God by his spirit work out what he wants to do with it. So, and me espousing that, I don't think is uh, uh, at any odds to what's going on around us. Um, Moore College is one of those bastions of, of conservative evangelical thought. The principal, Mark Thompson, one of his publications is uh, on the perspicuity of scripture. Uh, it's a clear and present word. It's in that same series that... Um, uh, there's a number of them in that series. Uh, I can't remember the name of the series now, but it's a great book on on the nature of scripture. It's called A Clear and Present Word. It's on the perspicuity of scripture. Uh, so that's kind of, that's the milieu that we're swimming in here. Uh, and, and we're all thoroughly convinced our job is to be opening up the Bible with people and helping them see how good the Lord Jesus Christ is and let God gather his, gather his elect as he chooses to. Exactly. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Uh, and I think all of that is, I think all of that is quite clearly in the articles, and especially when you read, uh, when you read the homilies uh, uh, with them. And because Presbyterians are a little bit slower on the uptake, the Westminster needed to just flesh it all out a bit. <laughs> I, I, I've taken heat for being an Episcopalian with <laughs> with the Westminster standards. I'm used to it, you know. Sure, the, sure. I was in the Navy Marine Corps chaplaincy, so yeah. uh, I've been with every stripe that's out there. And the Episcopalian is a Westminster Confession. What in the world? Yeah. Uh, and then the prayer book, I got that. And then I got the Westminster Confession. And the Presbyterians are, you know, ribbing me about having a prayer book. So whatever. It's a, the, yeah. the old prayer book. I love it. I love the Westminster Standards. But I'm... Um, educationally the my lineage is jay gresham machin is my great grandfather okay then well that's quite a pedigree that's quite a pedigree i i i'm i'm supremely grateful for the education that i got uh here in sydney and uh, not just a, th a standard three-year uh course but then a fourth year which allowed me to really dig deep into some subjects to do my own little uh dissertation they call it a project but fifteen thousand words on a, on, a, on my you know on a topic i'm really interested in and um and just it has really set me up and, and i'm i'm phenomenally grateful for it you're talking about four theological years on top yeah. of bachelor's uh, well, so they call it a bachelor's, a bachelor of divinity. So my first degree is from years ago. It's I'm a I have a BSc honors in accounting and financial analysis from back in the UK. As exciting as that is, right? You know. Um, so the the degree that we did is it's called a bachelor's degree. It's called a bachelor of divinity. It's a four year degree. I think, and I, I don't want to sound presumptuous or proud in saying this i think in any other context it would be treated as a master's yes. uh, um but it's australia they like to keep you humble uh they are actually currently going through the process now of of having it changed into into a master's so so uh people that are going to be going through more college soon i understand will be walking out with a master's uh but um uh it's important i think it's helpful just to go who cares what it's called um yes, it's yes. it's the quality of what it is so it's equivalent of a master's as a four think of a four-year a four-year um really quite intense degree with the fourth year with some scope for uh if you want to for doing a a project a, a dissertation yeah, we, we would call that a thm over here and yeah that, that, that kind of thing in four years yeah that kind of thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. by the way i had dr philip edgecombe hughes 
as a professor okay. Okay. at his Church of England. He had a pastor's heart for us students. Yeah. But he was tough, but you knew he loved you. And the seminar it was a THM PhD course. Yeah. Had that for a year in Second Corinthians. He would love to lead us, only six or eight of us. He'd lead you into heresy. And yeah. after you fell off the wagon, he'd have a yeah. few books. He'd correct you, and then he'd have some book recommendations. Yeah. He was, uh, and that's helpful, right, isn't it? Because that's part of the academic process is learning to have that conversation, learning to engage with those other things. Uh, more was great. It was residential, which is really, really important, I think. Um, uh, uh, the lecturers were all leaders of chaplaincy groups, so they, you know, one of them would be your chaplain uh, each each year, and uh, it was a, it was a, it was learning in community. Uh, part of it is sort of modeled on what, you know, Calvin used to say he would he would long for his seminaries to be like, you know, community living together and doing life together. And uh, and and so I, I walked come out of it with a with a with a peer group where we we know each other very, very well. And uh, and and, um, you know, many of us are making that effort just to keep just to keep in contact and, and look after one another. Brother, let me close this with prayer and then we'll have two or three minutes to filibuster. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm using a prayer from the REC prayer book as we've been talking sure. about schools. Let us pray. Almighty God, the author of all being, our only true guide and protector, visit with thy blessing, we pray thee, our church schools and seminaries of learning. Inspire the teachers with a proper sense of their solemn duties and with grace and strength to fulfill them. May our youth be trained up in thy nurture and admonition, implant in their hearts that fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, and that faith which overcometh the, the world. Fill their memories with the words of thy law. Open their understandings to the truth, as it is in Jesus, so that made wise unto salvation, they may escape the pollutions of error and sin and become strong in thy hands for the maintenance of pure and undefiled religion among men. Grant this for the sake of Jesus Christ, thy son, our savior. Amen. 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 So we, got, so we got about two more minutes. Now, yeah. is, this, is this Friday morning for you? It is Friday lunchtime for me. Yeah. That's probably why I got messed up at the beginning. Quite possibly. Quite possibly. <laughs> oh, my. What are, it's refreshing to talk. I get a totally different ethos and flavor on the Australian situation than yeah. my context, which is good. And and others also, you know, we, I've got an FCE young ordinand yep. at Christ College, Oxford. Yep. And the FCEs have had some problems. Yeah, and indeed. I've got some FCEers. I've got FCEC. I've got Church of England continuing. Okay. I've got some A ACNA people, PCA, OPC, URC, you name it. Yeah. Out there. And we're kind of strugg struggling to define uh, what does a reformed Anglican look like? So. Yeah. I, well, I, hopefully, I, hopefully, reformed Anglicans uh, can sit a little bit loose to what they absolutely need to look like. Um, I would say the more important question is what what do they believe, and then if they genuinely believe the articles, then let them work out in their local context what they ought to look like. Uh, um, uh, so that's that, that, that's where that's where I'd go. Otherwise, we know we're going to have the the, the you know uh, splitting over whether we should have bands or or or, or whatever. And that, at that point, you go. Come on. Yeah. Uh, evangelicals have always been the most ecumenical of creatures, haven't they? Uh, so so ultimately, I want to know that you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you love his word and you love his people. Uh, and uh, and at, that one, you know, at that point, I'm even friends with the Reformed Baptists. Yes, we have, that's one thing we added to the Holy Communion service was a statement to this effect. All those who love our divine and exalted Lord in truth yep. and in sincerity yep. Yep. are warmly and affectionately invited to this, our yep. Lord's yep. table. 
And yeah. it it you had Methodists, you had Baptists, you had Presbyterians, a charity. That's what I liked about the RC. There was a charity. Yeah. Was when I was in the Presbyterian world, we were always wrangling over doctrine and we were a, kind of a tougher Marine Corps type breed, but the REC's yeah. had a love and charity and humility that was just glorious. And that's and that's part of the love of the um of of the genuine gospel the genuine gospel love of of yeah. just going yeah we it's we either believe it or or we don't I certainly make that clear when when I'm introducing the Lord's Supper. Uh, I've month. got yeah. I'm gonna have to call it because it's at the forty okay. thing, and I'll be in touch with you again, brothers. Refreshing. Wonderful, Donald. You too. Thank you. Take bye. care, my friend. Bye bye.